Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to take things in a little bit different direction today because as the title of this episode implies, we're going to talk about due diligence. And in about 2010 or 2011, I met Candace Tao, and she explained to me what due diligence were. And I thought, you know, 10 years later, it'd be great to have her come back and explain yet again due diligence because I've used her wisdom in all of the versions of my handbook. So Candace, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, first of all, welcome back. Thanks so much, Tom. Great to be here. Candace, you've been in uh, the investigative field for a long, long time. I won't say how long, but a long time. And you have done numerous investigations. You have done investigations all over the world. And we're here to focus on due diligence in FCPA background investigations. And so Candace, um, you've talked about the performing the due diligence, but there's a step where you have to analyze it. Do you, how do you advocate looking at due diligence, moving to the point where you've identified a red flag and, and try to remediate it? Do you try to identify those red flags for the people who then need to either clear the red flag or try to remediate something or what's sort of that next step? So the next step is in actionable recommendations, really. So it depends on what we find. Um, there are endless uh, combinations of issues that arise, as you can imagine, whether it's criminal activity, reputational I issues, litigious behavior, um, misrepresentation, who, who actually owns the company, um, an executive may hide where they've worked at, they're just myriad of issues that could um, come up. So it's really important that whoever's doing the investigation for you, um, for your company, that they understand what is the information that they're looking at, and preferably in the context of the deal itself, if possible. It's not always possible. Um, plenty of times we have to find information, go back to the client and say, look, we found this information. Is it of concern to you in your particular situation or not? And it may be, or it may not be. So it could be that um, somebody has misrepresented where they've worked. And when we go to find out further that the, where the person worked that they did not disclose, that actually they may have been sued for, in that position, or they may have gotten uh, into trouble with regulatory agencies. And we've even found, sad to say, but true, we've even found chief compliance officers who've been in those kind of situations who are hiding that information going forward. And so that's extremely important information to find, obviously. Or it could be that the company um, was involved in too many civil lawsuits, for example, and obviously have some kind of litigious issues going on or that they've been involved in other types of bribery or corruption issues, they change the name of the company so that people who only check the actual name of the company that they've provided, they think that nobody will find that they were operating under a different name recently. And um, when you find the actual company's name that they were uh, in trouble over, that's how you find that type of information. So let's say we've had situations where um, investors, for example, uh, or business owners have six companies uh, under very similar names. You know, it could be American Trading or American um, American Designs Limited or something like that. So similar core name, but actually a different company name. And so if you're not sure how they're connected, you wouldn't find that they have civil issues um, or criminal issues even. So there's a lot of information that is easily missed, particularly if it's just a database search, and even more so if you don't know how the different entities connect with one another. Candice, what would you say are your three key takeaways for this topic? So the three key takeaways are, um, know who you're doing business with, <laughs> do, the, do your due diligence, don't skimp out by doing the basic due diligence that you think is sufficient. If you see red flags, please make sure that you do pursue what those red flags are. Take it, notch it up to the next level of due diligence. And then I would say, um, 
if you're not doing deep dive due diligence, you're not finding reputational issues. You just can't find reputational issues on database searches. It's very rare to find that. So I would recommend that you consider, particularly if the deal is in high risk area, or if it's a key executive that you're hiring, someone that's going to have operational responsibilities, let's say exceeding $5 million a year, which is most executives today, um, that you do do the level three due diligence so that you can determine whether or not you have a risk involved in hiring that person to begin with, or if you're actually planning to do business with a business entity, uh, let's say it's a merger or acquisition, that you're considering the true reputational issues of that company. So what are today's three key takeaways? Number one, there is no set formula for the clearing of red flags or the evaluation of due diligence. Each case is handled on its own. Number two, know when to say enough has been done. And number three, Always remember, you must document, document, document your evaluation of red flags. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program, and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow for another episode. If I could ask one thing and a call to action, if you would tell one person about our year-long series on one month to a more effective compliance program for different areas of compliance, in the month of April, it's third parties. This is Tom Fox. 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is a production of the award-winning Compliance Podcast Network.